listening to the Cross Kingdom Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message from Justin Carpenter. Good job, Kylie. Good job. <sighs> what do you all think? It's, it's interesting. I don't, I don't know... <clears throat> There's a, um, when the presence of the Lord gets heavier and worship and ministry time starts, you can actually see a tangible haze in the atmosphere in this building. And and that is a tangible tangible manifestation of his presence. Um, The Azuzu Street, the glory of the Lord, when it talks about the smoke filled filled the house, it... It was like fog. There was testimonies of children playing hide and seek at floor level because of how thick the tangible presence of the glory of the Lord was. Um, I I do not personally believe that those uh, manifestations are over. God God chooses how He manifests to us. We, We don't. We're not in charge of how He shows up. We position ourselves, we posture our, our hearts with a place of humility, expectancy, hunger, but how he manifests, it's up to him. I said this first service, we don't get to um, put in a list of three visions, one translation, one throne room encounter, and a couple of dreams. Thank you, Jesus. It, it's, not, it's, it's not a drive-through spirituality, Right? And I, I just want to encourage you because I'm gonna I'm fixing to talk about some some um, interaction between heaven and earth, and hopefully get a little bit of a snapshot on how the Lord's prayer, when it says "Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven," that is our marching orders. Jesus didn't die so that one day we experience heaven; He died to get heaven inside of us. And it's, it's our mandate, it's our commission right now to bring heaven to earth. We co-labor with him. It says the heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but he's given the earth to the sons of men. So <clears throat> we have a responsibility. We have been left behind, people. And, um, you know, just a little side note, you know, you, the, the word rapture, is based off of one scripture in the entire New Covenant, and it's when it talks about being caught up or snatched up. Only one verse. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving you with tension. I'm actually going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to teach on the end times pretty quick here uh, to, try to try to clear up some misconceptions so that... When that time comes, if we are here and things don't work out the way you were told they would with our Western dream, uh, then you'll actually be prepared. So, but when he says, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Can we all agree that in that moment, everything that was important to the Lord was addressed to the disciples? Right? So he said, Lord, teach us. They said, teach us how to pray, Lord. And the first thing he did was say, my father. He wanted us to connect to the father heart of God first and foremost so that we don't live as orphans. Right? Because if you live as orphans, then you build empires and you don't leave inheritance for your children because it's all about you, your fame, your rock star, all of that. And that's an orphan mindset. But he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. So what in the world is going on in heaven when we're praying? What's going on in heaven when we're praying the Lord's Prayer? When we're saying, Lord, just like it is in heaven. You can't get a more apostolic prayer than that. Are you with me? And so I want to talk to you very briefly, in my opinion, <clears throat> you may not agree with brief, 
but I, I want to talk to you about the family in heaven, his sons, meaning his Benai Elohim, the sons of God, his angels, his um, divine counsel and what is happening because we need to understand that every single prayer that we pray is an act of spiritual warfare in one way or another. Why do I say that? Because anytime you petition the Lord to do anything on your behalf, things start happening. Angels are released according to his word, which there's never been a single angel commanded by a human being ever. So don't say, I com- you ain't commanding crap. You're not commanding angels. It's not biblical. Are you with me? I don't want to break any toes here, but it specifically says that angels respond according to the word of the Lord. So if you're praying according to his will, you're praying his word, then the chances of having a whole lot of angelic activity with you is going to be a whole lot better than you thinking you're commanding an angel to do something. Just remember, one angel wiped out 185,000 Assyrians. They may carry the fear of the Lord. Are you with me? So, <clears throat> little recap. When we think about the fall of man, most people simply think about Genesis 3, right? The snake, the serpent, which I, you know, I just want to say as a side note, if a four-legged serpent came up to me and started talking to me, I would think I would be a little concerned. It didn't seem to bother them at all, by the way. And... uh Adam was silent the whole time. And then he blames Eve. Silence of Adam. And so the fall happens. But we don't pay attention to this theme that takes place with sin and further decay. Because just three chapters later in Genesis 6, you see that the Benai Elohim, the sons of God, make a pack. They, they see the daughters of men, Scripture says, and they take them as their wives. Benai Elohim is only used for angels. It is not used for, for man, okay? And we know that as a result of that, the Nephilim came, right? And it says there was Nephilim in those days and after the flood. And Jesus said, just like in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man returns. So do you think there may be Nephilim today? Absolutely. It's what we translate giant. That's the Hebrew word for giants. So you have Genesis 6. Then you fast forward, I think, a chapter, and you have the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, think about this. Um, Humanity was in such alignment, agreement, in the soul of man, not the spirit, but the soul that God said, hey, we need to go down and see what's going on because nothing is impossible for them now because they're one. Agreement in the soul. Now, I have a question for you. There's a reason why the Lord hates discord and division and those that sow discord among the brethren. Now, for one moment, think of the potential for the kingdom if we, as a new creation, a new breed that's never been on the earth before the cross, actually were in unity. We were one in spirit, not just soul. What would happen? For one, we know in the Psalms it says that God commands a blessing when the brethren dwell in what? Unity. <clears throat> so, and the other thing about the Tower of Babel is you have to understand Nimrod was actually one of the first Nephilim. It says, and Nimrod began to become a mighty one in the earth. If you really study that, whatever spiritual juju was going on there for that transformation, he began to do that. And... He builds Babel, the city. They build this place, a tower. They said they wanted to reach the heavens. This tower was not necessarily a literal skyscraper. Are you with me? 
It means a spiritual high place. It meant a place where they could connect to spiritual beings or the Elohim, which many people think the word Elohim is directly connected to Yahweh. It's not, Elohim is used for other gods. It's not unique to Yahweh. Yahweh is only used for Yahweh. Are y'all with me so far? I'm trying to lay a whole lot of sidewalk here real quick. <clears throat> so Babel happens. God comes down, brings confusion over all the languages. I have a hard enough time with English if you hadn't figured that out. And he, all of a sudden, all these nations are dispersed. Didn't you ever wonder like, okay, so what, what's the background of this? He, he brought all these languages in, confused the people, sent, sent the nations out all over the earth. But what is, what is the purpose in that? What is the interaction between heaven and earth? What's going on here? I'm glad you asked. So Deuteronomy 32, uh, 8 and 9 says, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind... This is a snapshot into Babel. So follow this. When he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God, according to the numbers of the Benai Elohim. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his allotted heritage. So Babel hits, he disperses the nations, and he tells the divine council, the, the sons of God, the Benai Elohim, which we get more revelation of all of this structure in the new covenant, which Paul and Ephesians clearly stated. And he puts the council, these principalities, over the nations. But he says, but Israel, Jacob, you're mine. That was the moment when he said, you're mine. So, what happens is when you go to Psalm 82, 1 to 8, we actually see that these sons of God, they weren't all good. And so he literally holds a council with them to bring judgment. Anybody ever heard this teaching? Yeah, a couple of y'all. So in, in, well, it's all here, I promise, it's scripture. <laughs> Psalms 82, <clears throat> God has taken his place in the divine council. This is the council that's over the nations when they were divided and they had principalities put over them. In the midst of the gods, which is Elohim in the Hebrew, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are Elohims, sons of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, and judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations." So we get a snapshot, we get a picture of the failed job of this council to be ruling nations and actually persuading them towards righteousness. Do you understand? Let, let me give you this illustration. A demon will come next to you, give you thoughts, and if you don't recognize those thoughts aren't yours, you begin to partner with that spirit you, and that spirit begins to make a bond with you through deception because you think it's your thoughts. And then all of a sudden, now it becomes familiar to you to such a degree you cannot distinguish its thoughts versus yours. Are you with me? That principle is what happens with principalities, except for they govern a nation and they're either influencing the thought process of a nation towards righteousness or lawlessness. When a nation is in lawlessness then the principle of if my people, who's my people? The church. If my people who are called by my name show what? Humble themselves. Come on. Repent, seek my face. He goes, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Part of that healing is then now the Lord 
is justified to remove that principality that is not ruling with righteousness, a fallen principality, and actually replace it with a righteous principality, a, a principality that is not broken covenant with God. Are you all with me? I know this stuff is like, first time I read Psalm 82, I was like, there's other gods? <laughs> no, there's no, there, 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 it was the council, right? The Elohim. But it messes with you because I was taught, I went to Bible college, y'all, and I always thought the name Elohim, the name, one of the names for, for God was distinct to him. So because I'm messing, you know, it's messing with my theology. This is what I say. God will never violate his word, but he'll violate your understanding of it. Anybody been there? Yes. So this interaction of heaven and earth, we're watching our nation right now. We are, we're in the pendulum. And we, we, just, we just watched um, a, a, an attempted assassination on Trump a week ago, which by the way, Last, I think it was last Sunday when I, when I got the word that the winds of change are blowing. The very next morning, Melania wrote a letter and released it to the United States. And at the end of her letter, it said, and the winds of change are here. So I was like, okay, Lord, I'm paying attention. And I'm like, so I started asking the Lord, well, what all's involved in the winds of change? And, and I... Once I feel like I've gotten enough insight from him, I'll probably dive deeper into that. But we can look with our natural eye right now and recognize that the winds are blowing. The um, uh, church as usual is disappearing. Judgment starts first in the house of God. He's, he's dealing with his elders, his leaders in the church. He is changing thrones. You know, this is an election year all over the world. Did y'all know that? all over the world. Many nations are getting new kings and presidents. This is a pivotal, pivotal year for elections. And the winds of change are here. It's going to be very interesting. <clears throat> Man, I don't want to say that. Um, you got to get, you got to give me grace on this. Okay. And I'm not saying this is Necessarily, thus saith the Lord. It, obviously, it's looking like we know who the president's going to be, right? I, I, when, when last week happened and, and he, as a leader, put his fist up and said, keep fighting, there, I, when you watched it, did you not feel something? Like there, there was like, okay, something significantly shifted there. And I'm not trying to be political in this moment, but because we're called to pray for all leaders, right? Regardless if you like them or not, whether they can remember anything or not, we pray for them. And so, um, but let me say this. There's very turbulent times ahead of us as a nation, regardless of what happens, period. There are things, there's a ball rolling that will not um, go back up the mountain, if you will. There, there are difficulties ahead of us as a country, economically, politically. There's still difficulties ahead of us with more church exposures. Navigating through this, what John Paul coined the perfect storm in 2009, um, navigating through this means that you need to be close to the Lord. We need to understand his government, his structure, his how we interact with him, how we partner with seeing heaven come to earth. I don't know about y'all, but I don't, I, I don't want to live where it, it takes 45 minutes to see somebody healed from a headache. Right? Anybody been there? It's like, it seems like it's the smallest thing in the world you're praying for, and it's like, what is going on? So there, there, there are things that he's pruning inside of us as a preparation I also want to encourage you, never look at a political leader like a savior. Otherwise, you have an idol. So, I'm 
crawling my hand up from my shoulder. <clears throat> In Ephesians 3, 7 to 10, Paul says, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Y'all, it says we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. And and there's a teaching out there that basically, and it's very Gnostic in nature, it basically says we can access heaven at will because we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. And it's it's very poor exegesis. It's, It's very, very, very poor Bible study because if you go on in that chapter, it says, so that in the life to come. There's a part of our inheritance that we do not have yet here on this side of eternity. Paul, Paul rebukes the, the, the men of the church for acting as mere humans. And he says, do you not know you will judge angels? But you're not judging angels right now. And if you try it, it could cost you your life. And so there, there's, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. It is our mandate to show the manifold wisdom of God. And one of the primary ways in which the manifold wisdom of God is being made known is by actually preaching the mystery that's been hidden in God, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the eternal gospel of the kingdom. And yet today we still find so many people that never share their faith. Uh, Penn and Teller, you know, the the music, or magicians that... You know, the big tall dude, the, I think it's Penn who's the atheist, right? Or is it Teller? Penn? I don't know, the tall dude, yeah. Some time ago, he said, how much does a Christian have to hate people by not sharing his faith if it's true? An atheist said that. Recognizing the impact of the gospel an atheist said that, recognizing if the gospel is true, how can believers not share the gospel to those around them? See, I think we forget this is just practice. This side of eternity, we're co-laboring with the Lord, but on the other side of heaven, when you go to heaven, you're not gonna be sitting there playing a harp next to David and just, oh, everything's so great. It actually says that we're going to rule and reign with him. And if you're, an, if you're an amillennialist, bless your heart. If we're in the millennial reign, I want my money back right now because this doesn't look like the millennial reign that I read about. <clears throat> Ephesians six ten to 13, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil uh, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Y'all, it, it's, it's, it's too easy to forget that we're in a battle. There's too many distractions. Anybody ever um, wake up and be like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read my Bible. I have my Bible app. I, always re- I, I do my Bible app every morning. And, but have you ever accidentally pulled up Facebook first or Instagram and then, yeah, accidentally. And then you, and then all of a sudden there's 15 minutes later, you're mindlessly scrolling through shorts and reels and you're like, oh my word, I just wasted 15. I think I'm actually stupider after that. 
<laughs> I just wasted 15 minutes of my life and I could have been reading his word. You understand, the, great, you, the sword is his word. If we're in a spiritual battle and you don't know his word, it's like going out on the battlefield with no gun, getting shot at. Some of y'all look really excited. Glad to see. <clears throat> Here's another thing. Satan is in the wilderness. He's dealing with, uh, uh, he's attacking Jesus. And how does Jesus beat the enemy? No. Okay. So you think that might be a little important? Do you think we need something greater and bigger and secret that nobody knows about? Or do you think that's enough? If he dealt with Satan himself with his word, y'all, it's the simplicity of the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom, the eternal message that God became flesh and died in our spot. What's gonna change this nation is the church actually carrying the eternal gospel to everyone around them. You, you, you can vote to kingdom come. We, we don't even know how secure the voting system is right now. Voting is not gonna transform the hearts of people. Just like with human trafficking, you can't rescue your, uh, your way out of it. People have to get saved. People have to have their hearts changed. Because as long as there's desire, wicked desire in man's heart, there's always going to be a demand for things. It's just the truth. And if we're not, step one, sharing the gospel with those around us, looking intentionally for opportunities to talk to people that don't know the Lord, how in the world are we partnering with the interaction of heaven to earth? How are, how are we involved in this battlefield? We're showing up butt naked on the battlefield with nothing. There's your picture. And some of y'all, never mind. I'm being good. Ephesians 6 paints the reality of what's going on all around us right now. Last week, it was huge when he turned his head just slightly. That was not an accident. I guarantee you in the spirit, there was an angel that said, Psh! even though he didn't feel it. Do you understand that the angels are ministering spirits assigned to us that will inherit eternal life? But I can tell you this, that if you actually practice exercising your spiritual senses, you can get to a place when God starts moving, you can actually discern the difference between an angel ministering with God's presence versus the Holy Spirit ministering himself. Because an angel carrying his presence discerns different than the Holy Spirit. This is available to all of us because you're a new creation in Christ. The God of the universe lives inside of you. So why are you losing it? Why do we fear, fret, and worry? Why are we worried about the future? We already know the end. Why are we afraid to share the gospel with people? Think about it right now. Think about the last time you actually shared the gospel with someone. Y'all, that's ground zero. Like this is, that's where it starts. It starts with us as the body of Christ being the light and salt because the whole intention of revival is to bring a sustained revival is to bring reformation. And the only way you see reformation is if you actually have the entire fivefold ministry equipping the saints for the work of the ministry and actually getting them into the seven mountains of influence 
so that you can actually see the culture transformed. It's not about us perfecting the perfect service on Sunday morning. Hebrews 1, 6 to 7, and uh, verse 13 and 14. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? I've had one angelic visitation in my life. One. When I hear people talk about having angelic visitations every day and going to heaven every day, I call hogwash on it. There's one time I was out of my physical body standing before an angel. And not that you, all of you, when you have God dreams, you're actually interacting with angels in those dreams. And when you have warfare dreams, you're interacting with fallen spirits and you need to realize that. See, we... we there, there's enough here that if you actually spent time, it would be impossible for you to have a natural biblical world view. And that's one of the greatest stumbling blocks in the United States church is that we have a natural biblical worldview rather than a supernatural. You realize that if you pull all dreams and visions out of the Bible, you would lose one third of the Bible. One third. I grew up in a denomination that didn't believe in any of this stuff. I was so narrow-minded I could see through a keyhole with both eyes. Was I, was I, hey, she knew me when I was that way. Somehow God had mercy on me. Um, I still got to marry her. So, what does it look like if the, if the winds of change are blowing What is God trying to change in your life right now? Typically, what I see is when pressure starts coming into a part of my life and it's like I start feeling pressure, it's because something needs to change in that area. And God has no problems with increasing that pressure on you. Did you ever figure that out? You you, want to be stubborn? He just goes... And he'll keep turning it up. So where's your pressure right now? What is the Holy Spirit taking his massive God finger and pointing at? Because we're all in process, y'all. Are you with me? So we all need healing, but inner healing should not last a lifetime. If you've been in an inner healing for 15 years, something, something needs to be evaluated but you will grow up in him until you leave out of here. We'll continue to grow up. It says, though the outward man's perishing, the inward man's being renewed day by day by his word. See, I think one of the things with things changing is that we have got to get back to the basics of the kingdom. If, if, number one, if, if you never share your faith, holy cow, there's one. There's one. I have a question. I don't know, might be 170 people in here this morning, maybe. What if every one of you, this week, every single person in this place was able to lead somebody to the Lord? 
And I, and I don't mean that means they come here, whatever. It's the body of Christ. But the reality is 170 souls come into the kingdom. Hell was plundered. And it was because we just opened our mouths in obedience to make disciples of all nations. Go. He didn't say sit. He said go. But unfortunately, it's usually persecution that makes us go. It's usually persecution that actually motivates us to press into the Lord and actually live in the kingdom then. I want to tell you, the days ahead, you're going to have to learn kingdom principles and how to operate and function truly in the kingdom in spirit and truth. It's not easy, y'all. The tests get bigger. You get bigger words, you got to have bigger backbone. It's been my desire. Oh, here we go. I feel emotion. (laughs) It's been my desire to keep the ministry out of debt. It's been my desire to, to be able to build the new buildings without a big old monster loan. And we've gotten words about moving forward and how to move forward. And two days ago, I told Lisa, I was like, yeah, but I, I haven't had a real clear word from the Lord personally yet. And then I'm having breakfast yesterday with somebody and they're praying over me. And all of a sudden they start praying about Isaac and laying Isaac on the altar and provision and show him the hidden provision. And as they're praying about provision and hidden provision over me, the Holy Spirit says, that's your confirmation. So guess what? We're breaking ground this fall without a loan by faith. We're, we're finally at a point with the plans that we're actually um, bidding them out with our subs right now. So, and, and I understand that's just a building. You're the church. But God has huge plans for this region, y'all. So we need to allow the Lord to examine us now. You know, there's a reason for basic training for those of you that have been in military. There's a reason why when people decide to go run a marathon, they don't go the first day and go run 20 miles. That's stupid. I was, side note, I know we're almost done. Uh, We were living in Lynchburg, Virginia, and I was training for a 10 miler. I know I'm not built for distance, but I was, I was training And I was at five miles and my buddy and his wife were going to do the rock and roll half a marathon in Virginia Beach. His wife, Jen, messes her knee up the day before. I'm young, so obviously I didn't die. I'm still here. And uh, and he goes, man, uh, run. Why don't you run in her place? I was like, dude, I've never ran more than five miles. Like, I can't run 13. He's like, come on, man, just run with me. I was like, okay, fine. So I put her chip on my shoe. When I came across the finish line, it said Jen Yates, but it had my face. (laughs) And uh, because they gave me a plaque and and they X'd out Jen Jen Yates, the certificate, and put Justin Carpenter. And I went from five miles to 13.1 miles in one run. Hardest thing I ever did in my entire life. At mile 10, downtown Virginia Beach, I'm literally yelling at myself, come on, you wuss. I'm like, you know, all the psychological stuff. And I get across the line and I like to not come up when I go to grab one of those towels and all that. That's not, I I say all that because I'm I'm not bragging, trust me. My heart rate was up for like three days. (laughs) But um, that's not, that's not the time to go, oh, I I guess I should have been training a little bit. Are you with me? The United States that we, well, at least... I'm 47, so I would say mid-40s and older. That United States is not here today. Can, can we all agree on that? Yes. And, we, and now I don't believe for a moment the Lord's done with our country. But I'm telling you right now, he's going to use the church to bring it back, not politics. Are you with me? But that means we've got to be about our father's business. And yes, I know I don't have my literal Bible right here, but that is our instruction manual to the kingdom. 
It's our instruction manual to interact in intimacy with the Lord. It's our instruction manual for battle. Everything we need for life and godliness, for the training and righteousness, is there in his word. And I just want to encourage you all, allow the Lord in this season to prune what needs to be pruned. Allow him to realign what needs to be realigned. Allow him to highlight things, highlight blind spots, and surrender those blind spots. You understand, if you don't let go, you're guaranteed to lose your life in that area. If you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, then you find it. And this, it's, it's, it's a daily choice, y'all. It's absolutely a daily choice. So it's my heart that we have good counsel, good, good spirits over Kerr County, right? Y'all stand. Please. If the prayer team would come forward. Well, hopefully some of that made sense. I woke up at 7 o'clock this morning not having a clue what I was going to talk about. That seems to be the theme in my life. Lisa says that scares her too much to do that. So, Father, Lord, may we have the sensitivity to your spirit. Lord, to know the times and seasons we're in like the sons of Issachar. Lord, give us insight. The winds of change are blowing. Lord, you said in John 6. Thank you for listening. For more messages and other resources, please subscribe to this podcast or go to our website at www.crosskingdom.org.